tonight, I thought we would go over another pond structure. So this was a request that was sent in by some club members. And uh, in a rare moment of generosity, I'm gonna do what three different people wanted. People kept saying they wanted different things. So I'm gonna do it all tonight. Uh, we're gonna go over the French pond structure because that was recommended by somebody. Somebody else suggested, you know, why don't you show your own games? So, all right, I'm gonna show some of my own games for I think the first time. It's, you know, like my 60th lecture. I don't think we've gone over any of my games. So embarrass myself a little bit tonight. And then somebody was like, you know, make sure you show a loss. So, all right, fine, Mario, we'll show a loss. <laughs> um, and then Mario showed up too. Ben Simon's like, you're gonna show a loss? I'm like, yeah, I'll show a loss. All right, so uh, we'll embarrass myself a little bit tonight. That's fine. But for now, we're gonna throw it over to the board. We're gonna look at three different structures. So it's kind of the whole family of French defense pawn structures that you might see, because what tends to happen is at some point pawn structures convert themselves into a different type of pawn structure. So it starts one way, but then when there's some exchanges of pawns, the pawn structure changes. So it's it's kind of important to uh, just get a good idea of you know what to do in different pawn structures. And this is Tuesday night, not Monday, with the openings class. So on Tuesdays, we, we can tell you the the truth about Tuesdays. So really in chess, and I think somebody said this, hopefully you online can tell me who said this because I, 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 I tried to look it up quickly and I couldn't figure out who actually said this. But it's been said, maybe, or else I made it up. There are no openings in chess, only pawn structures. So really the pawns are gonna tell you where you wanna put all your pieces. They're gonna outline the plans for you in the middle game. They're really gonna tell you what it's all about. Um, and then if this was, you know, a Saturday tactical challenge, then I'd just tell you it's just 99% tactics. So there's no openings or strategy or pawn structures, just tactics. So depending on the day, I'll, I'll tell you whatever, whatever you want to hear. But today we're going to look at this pawn structure that comes generally out of the French advanced. So um, it can also come out of sort of a Karl Kahn, if you can imagine the, the C pawn somewhere else. And I kind of like this. It's a nice closed structure. So when you, we start with the French, I think this is a, a great one to look at because the pawns have already sort of outlined where both people are going to be playing. Now, white has more space on the king side. You can see that his farthest advanced pawn is on e5, which is on the king side. And you'll see that the pawns tend to point towards the king side. So this is another good indication of where you want to play. Um, so you can see that, okay, so the pawns are kind of pointing that way, you got more space over there. Equally, black has more space on the queen side. The farthest advanced pawn is the pawn on d5. And you can see the pawns sort of aim towards the queen side. So that's where both players should be playing. So the big plan here for white in general is to play on this side, moves like f4 and f5. Um, this is a typical maneuver that we might see in the middle game. And from here, I can either take on e6, or I can play a move like f6, which might be useful in an attack. So since I get to play on the king side, and black most frequently castles over here on the king side, it's typically white in this structure that can get a big attack. We can imagine the bishop on d3. We can imagine a queen coming in. We can imagine knights coming in. Um, this bishop also might sometimes be useful. So in this type of position, it's actually white that might be thinking of an attack if black is castled over there. So sometimes as black, you don't castle right away. You just kind of wait in the center for a while. And maybe you castle, maybe you don't later, depending on, on the position. Because we can also imagine there is the possibility of Greek gifts if we have all of our, our trio of pieces here. So that's something we always want to keep in the back of our mind. And black, for his part, will try to get some counterplay against the center. So you can imagine a move like c5. And white will typically bolster the center with a pawn. And black can get all of his pieces into the attack on d4. So the knight goes to c6, the queen goes to b6. This is a very common occurrence. And black tries to get counterplay on the center and on the queen side. It's also very common um, that at some point the other break, so if you don't play c5, your other major break in this position is going to be f6 which often is a good way to get counterplay and make it slightly more difficult for white to attack because sometimes it's hard to attack when stuff is happening in the center. If you can make a lot of tension in the center, it can be you know, quite difficult to attack sometimes because things can change. And if the center falls apart, you better checkmate me or I'll just take the center. Um, 
And anyway, somebody also asked me too, like, why would anybody play this way as black? White just like attacks. Why would you want to get attacked? Well, it's it is double-edged. So one thing that happens too is when white moves all of his pawns and he goes and he tries to checkmate you, he is making lots and lots of weaknesses. So he does have to go try to get you, but he can leave lots of weaknesses behind. So very often in the French, the end game will actually favor black because white makes a lot of weaknesses in an attempt to get after the king. And if you break through in the center or on the queen side, um, white could actually end up in trouble. So that's one reason to play this way as black. Um, and okay, we'll sort of see these games, these, these plans in action. Uh, I'm gonna show the first game. So, boop. let's see. And we will be going over my games for some reason and we'll flip the board. Um, all these games were played in 2013 or 2014 because that's about when I stopped playing chess, really, because um, I started working here. <laughs> so something, yeah, if you, if you want to get good at chess, don't work at a chess club. That's like the worst thing you can do for your chess. Well, this is a game I played against a club favorite, Preston Smith. So the people in the audience probably know Preston. Yeah, yeah, Junior Bug. Yeah, he's the guy that says Junior Bug, calls everyone that. He walks in and says, I'm the champ, the champ's here, I'm the greatest. Uh, a lot of funny quips from him. You know, there's, there's only two great chess players in the world and I'm both of them. You know, he's, he's out there trash talking with, with the best of them. And what, uh, what's really fun about playing Preston, it's, it's always a lot of fun. And he's like 18, he was like 1850 at the time of this game, which I think was his peak. So that's, it was the right time to play him. Um, is he will just attack you no matter what, even if it's not called for. Like he's just gonna attack you, he's gonna play for tactics. So the games are always entertaining. Like it's just a guarantee it's gonna be an exciting game. So this was the Show Me Classic from 2013. Um, we'll get the, the pawn structure on the board. So here we have it, uh, it was the French advance. And uh, the most common move here is B6, getting more pressure on D4. But uh, I played Bishop D7, that's what I like to play. And then usually, I'll play f6 and I'll move my king and I'll even castle over on the queen side and I'll attack you on the king side. So that's what happens sometimes. That's at least how I was playing the French at that time. Um, and here already a, a strange move. He played bishop to e3. And okay, I mean, so it undefends the pawn. And I've actually had conversations with Bill Thompson who used to work here. We used to talk about this because he always liked to play it this way. So he would play this position, and you'd always play here, and you'd argue for how good it is, but uh, not a particularly good move, in, in my opinion. So uh, probably queen b6 is the most appropriate move. We're gonna go kind of quickly through the games. We're mostly focused here on the pawn structure, but there's some funny stuff that happened. All right, so I'm on his b pawn, so he protects it. Um, and so what happened in this game, too, you'll see this is a very useful piece for him, you know, so if I ever, castle this way, maybe I'll get into some trouble. But after a, a pretty simple maneuver here, I forced him to get rid of his light squared bishop. And already my position is quite good. Now it's easy for me to get my pieces out. I can, you know, get this guy out and I can castle and double on the C file. <laughs> so I already have pressure on the queen side and he's, you know, a long ways away from attacking me. I mean, I know he'll attack me at some point because he's, he's Preston, but... Um, all right, so I get my pieces out. And then a3 was also a, a pretty bad move for him that ultimately will, will cost him the game here. Um, so, all right, so I'm gonna put my queen on b3 at some point. All right, he finally played g4. Like, I was waiting for that because it's Preston. So I, like, I knew he's gonna play g4 at some point. And uh, in some position here, I went in. So he's gonna go attack me, even if there's no attack. He's just, he's still gonna do it. And, all right, I'm just, infiltrating into the light squares. Now he noticed I've sort of lined these people up for a night. So he went here and I had seen this. And then here I thought maybe 10 minutes or something. And he just blitzes. So I knew he was gonna spend less than five minutes for all of his moves. So this is the only move I thought about all game. Like this is the only time I actually calculated. And uh, we were both playing fast and that's, that's kind of how this game went. And here I played a tactical move. So this is this here I'll actually pause and you can pause at home, get a little more time, but I guess I'll, I'll test the audience for the first time. Uh, what tactical move did I play? And obviously I understand that this is coming potentially. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's, it's tough. That's why I had to calculate here, make sure that this move worked. But when I played queen b3, this is what I intended. Um, and so in this position, I'm going to give it away. I took on a3. So obviously, if he just takes back, then I take on c3. And then one second, you know, he blitzed out this move, which unfortunately doesn't work for him. So um, I take this pawn, and after he takes back, first I trade the queens, and then take the rook, and, and then take this. And so now I'm, I'm up a pawn, but I also have three passers. So we'll, we'll show the rest of the game just for fun, but okay, now I just, I just go and I win. Um, so this is what happens in this pawn structure. I win on the queen side. Um, but he's still going to attack me somehow. You know, I didn't, I didn't see that move coming, but he's going to come get me, and then, okay, now he's, he's going to get checkmated very soon. So he, he resigned in this position. But what it really sort of showed in this position is I got all the counterplay on the queen side that I wanted, and he did nothing on the king side. I mean, he eventually got stuff going. But I was able to get his light squared bishop, which was huge, and then, you know, I found a tactic on the queen side where I had, that's where I should be looking for all of my counterplay, and it all just worked out for me. So it's always fun to play Preston. That was a good one. Uh, let's we'll look at it from White's point of view for some reason. So this is the second French pawn structure that we're going to look at tonight. And the way that this can happen is if White takes on f6 and Black takes back, usually with a knight, sometimes with a queen, you can reach this pawn structure. And when showing somebody this too, and just this outline, they're like, this is horrible. And the obvious thing that they thought you know, was just horrible, and why would black ever accept this pawn structure, is the pawn on e6. So this seems like an, an obvious target. OK, yeah, you can put rooks and queens on the e file. I can, you know, I can get bishops and knights. I can just attack that, um, your pawn, a whole bunch of times. So why would black ever want this? And it's true, and especially if white can reach an end game where he's got this awesome knight here and black is you know, stuck with this bad bishop behind the pawn chain, then this can turn out really, really good for white. So white, black does obviously have to be kind of careful and get some active counterplay to offset the backwards pawn. Um, and just focusing still on white's plans, I usually tell all of my, my students that Attacking a backwards pawn like this is really a threefold process. So step one is controlling the square in front of the pawn. So you can imagine a rook on the e-file, you can imagine a knight, maybe a bishop, everybody looking in and protecting, yeah, not that far, not that far, the square right in front of the pawn. And the second step is to actually blockade the pawn. So we want a piece here. A knight would be really nice, you know, a bishop might also be fine, or a rook and queen, depending on, on what's left on the board, might also be a very good piece just to have sitting there. And once it's blockaded, then you can start focusing on the pawn itself. Now it's time to actually start going after and targeting the pawn. And with this method, it makes sure that black never gets to liberate his position. If black ever in this position gets to play a move like e5, and then the bishops can just come out very comfortably, Normally, black is you know, at least equal in such a position. Maybe even better, because if you can imagine this, and maybe, we, can we get rid of this pawn somehow? You can imagine a position like this that might occur, and now black has one extra central pawn, so this could actually be favorable for black if this sort of thing were to occur. So why would black accept this pawn structure? Well, typically, we're going to get a lot of active play. You can imagine, perhaps, I can sacrifice a rook on f3, shatter your pawns. Um, you can imagine this bishop, uh, what's his job in life? Well, sometimes he does the French maneuver or the Dutch maneuver based on whichever opening you play more often. Uh, you can do the wiggle and you can go all the way over to like h5 where perhaps you're pinning a knight. That seems like a decent square for the bishop. And you are looking for some active play. You know, also you can attack the center. You know, you can get a pawn structure like this. Oh, eh. Some, uh, one of the pawn fell by the wayside. But you can imagine a pawn structure like this, um, where you can get some pressure against the center. And we'll show uh, a game now where, uh, that I played against a player rated about 2050 or so. I don't know what he was rated at the time of this game. Um, I think he was 
2,000 already. Now he's probably much higher because this was 2014, the Millionaire Satellite. So whoever won this got to go to the, the Millionaire in Vegas tournament for free. So, so that, that was pretty cool. And let's get the opening on the board. All right, so we got the Tarash. And at some point, we get this position. And I've experimented with taking with the queen, which has done well for me in Blitz. But here I took with the knight. And in this game, we played thousands of moves of theory. Um, so to get to this position. So what it really revolves around largely, this position just based on the, the skeletal outline of the pawn structure, is control over e5. So we're both going to be fighting for that square because I don't want white to get complete control because if he controls e5, then he can blockade and then he can start targeting my pawn in the future. And so already he's probably thinking about a move like bishop to f4. And obviously he's the one that wants to trade the dark squared bishops because he's fighting for control of a dark square. So I you know, moved my queen to c7. This is all still theory. And so I've just prevented his bishop from going to f4. And so he has another way of trying to sneak his bishop around. So yet again, he's going to try to trade bishops. So I played knight h5, so that if his bishop goes back to g3, I'll just take it with my knight. And I'll preserve my bishop, and I'm, you know, I'm just fighting for control over e5. OK, so he went here. Um, so he went here. I think a little more common is to check first and then go here. But uh, this has all been played before. And now I do his, his moves. So you can pause at home, but can you play like Timothy over there? In this position, I took his knight. So this is sort of the active dynamic way that you want to play this way, because I do have a weakness, but I'm going to try to get some very, very active counterplay. So in the game, he took, and this is all still theory. Um, and so we reached some position. you know. And again, the game isn't the important part. And, um, I took all of his stuff. All right, so I'm feeling pretty good about this position already. And after he played f4, trying to prevent me from playing e5, I played e5 anyway. And the point is, now this guy, this dormant bishop, who was you know, a pretty bad piece, now he becomes a superstar. He goes to e4. And all right, so now things are already looking pretty good for me. And that's sort of the way I got rid of my weakness. I was playing very actively. I, you know, I'm attacking. Um, so we got this position, and then for some reason, you know, he, he traded into this endgame, and this is just a winning endgame for me, so this really isn't the point of the lecture, and I don't really want to show my own games, so we'll just speed through it. I, you know, I have two pass pawns, so I pushed them, and I was able to win this game. So that's sort of what you want to do when you have that sort of a structure. I got rid of my weakness. Um, and I got some active dynamic play. That's, that's the reason you would accept this pawn structure. And you know, so that's sort of the thing about the French, too. It's, it's often very positional, very solid opening, but it does have the potential to be a very dynamic weapon. And you know, even aggressive players might find some really sharp lines that they like to play in the French. So here's our third pawn structure that we're going to look at for the knight. And this pawn structure could be achieved if you take and white takes back with something, let's say, a knight. And the d4 outpost can be a very strong outpost for a knight. That's, that's a great square for a knight where it can't be challenged by a pawn. Um, so that's what can happen here. And again, we have more space over here as white. So we're thinking f4, f5, perhaps. And if you know black might be thinking, I'll get some counterplay over here, I'll play pawn to b4. That's one of the breaks that I have at my disposal. Um, sometimes, you know, especially like in the, the classical variation of the French, white might be castled over on this side, in which case both sides rush to, to checkmate each other. So stuff like this can happen. And you know, we all, everybody tries to checkmate everybody at the same time. So that also can lead to some very sharp chess where it's opposite side castling and there's, there's lots of attacks. Um, so let's go ahead and we'll look at my loss. So this, I'm really showing this one because it's kind of funny how I chose to lose. Um, this is my game against Predarshan Canapan from the Thanksgiving Open 2014. Uh, it was started off, it was, it was really good for me. I, mean, I beat a master in the first round, and now I'm playing an, an IM who's still GM strength. He's actually just 
couple weeks ago, officially, Fide recognized his, his GM title. So he got all of his norms, so now he is a, is a GM. And we'll get, so St. Louis's newest GM, we'll look at, at this game, where we got this structure. Okay, so here we are. And so this is funny, what I chose to do here. Now, my first instinct is to castle, maybe knight to c5 to prevent bishop d3, and maybe I jump in here. So those would be the obvious moves that I should perhaps consider. But at the time, I was watching a lot of TCEC, which is the chess engine competition. And I had seen a game between two computers, and the black computer had a very interesting strategy that had never been seen by humans. And there's probably a good reason. <laughs> and it, it's probably not a good strategy. And unfortunately, the computer that did this with black, it lost. But I said, all right, if it's good enough for a computer, it's good enough for me. And I, okay, I sort of figured that it was, it was bad, but I decided he won't know this strategy, so I'm going to do something totally novel here. Um, did you notice the computer lost? Oh, yeah, I knew the computer lost. Okay. That's, but you know, it's playing. He was only an IM at the time. I'm like, I'll do this, and it'll surprise him. And if it's good enough for a 3,000 rated computer, it should be good enough for a human, maybe, and I'll fool him, and he won't know what to do. But yeah, yeah, to the, the, the computer? No, your yeah, so he was you know, 2,500 or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a good player. He's, yeah, he's a grandmaster now, so he's, and he's always been sort of grandmaster strength. That's been he's been he was an IM for a long time, and he's been way over twenty five hundred. So it's like, okay, you're going to be a grandmaster at some point soon here, and he so he finally did it. So a big congrats to uh, to Priya Darshan. If if you're watching at home, um, all right. So I did this. I did some funny queenside stuff with pieces. And so all of this actually resembled what happened in the computer game. So I got to do everything I wanted. But I guess the moral of the story is don't play bad on purpose against a grandmaster. That's, that's the moral of the story here. Um, so this was the thing. So all of this happened like in the computer game. So I was like so happy. I'm like, yes, all of this. You know, very tactical nonsense. And you go here. And then you get to pick up the bishop. And yeah, yeah, I got the bishops. And then, all right, I'll, I'll get crushed later. And here, unfortunately, I, I made a big blunder. I should just probably take the bishop with my queen. I took with the bishop because I thought b4 was impossible, but then he played b4, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess he can do that. I thought I had some sacrifice here. I don't even remember what it was. I, maybe I was going to take with the bishop or something, but then I'm like, oh, he just takes here, and then he just moves his king or something. So I saw something like this, and I'm like, eh, <laughs> it's, just, it's not going to work. So I think so. I think like if here he would move one of these rooks. I don't know which one. And even if this, he can like take it or something. So I'm like, all right, it didn't work. So now I'm just losing. <laughs> so the rest of the game is pointless. So I didn't sack because it doesn't work, and then I just lose. And I decided to lose tactically, so I traded stuff tactically, and uh, and then he even gave up a pawn. I was like, darn. And then here he really crushed me. So this is a great move that he played. I don't think I saw it, but there's nothing better I could do anyway. But All right, now I'm just crushed. So here, I missed a very good opportunity to resign. This would be a nice, nice time to do it. But eh, I decided to check him. And I took this, and then all right, he gets the last check. So, so now I resign. Um, yeah, so I, I did something you know, a little goofy, but I thought it would it'd be fun. So maybe against a lower rated opponent, it would have worked. So they seem to do well when I play 2,000 and under. That's then the tactics all worked for me. In this game, he saw all my tactics, and I played bad on purpose, so I lost. Uh, um, but there you go. Hopefully, YouTube enjoyed <laughs> laughing at me a little bit. Um, so that gives you, hopefully, a good in indication as to the, uh, the French pawn structure, so you hopefully know which side you should play on. Hopefully, it gives you a little idea of where you should put your pieces in these types of openings. Um, and yeah, if you want to see something else, if, is there a pawn structure that you guys really want to see out there, just let me know in the comments below. And perhaps next time, uh, the pawn structure you guys pick will be the one that I, I show here on YouTube. So thanks, everybody, for coming out.